Open up your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This passage here has much to say about me as it does about you. Just because the uh, emphasis, if you will, might be on the minister, it still has much to say to each and every one of us uh, with our personal relationship with Christ. And so while the guideline is here or the standard by which uh, the minister is to minister, it also uh, has the attitude in which people should hold the minister to and, and the attitudes that the people themselves should have. Because guess what? Whether we like it or not, if we know the Lord is our personal Savior, we are to be his ambassadors into our world. We can speak volumes with our life to the world just as much as a pastor can on Sunday morning preaching the word of God. Because you might draw someone to you, to your personality, to your temperament as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, more so than I might from here. Matter of fact, I might turn them off. They might think I'm arrogant. They might think I'm a jerk. Whatever they might think. But your attitude might be the thing that draws them in. So you're a minister of God, if you know the Lord as your personal Savior. People, by the way, do have their own standards for a pastor, don't they? When churches get together, and because they need a pastor, their pastor has left for whatever reason, and they're looking for a pastor, the, the people get together, and I've seen churches go through all of these different things when they're looking for a minister. I was involved one time with the starts of looking for a pastor, calling a pastor, and I was discouraged because people got together, and they put all of these different demands on what a pastor has to be, and it had very little to do with what the Bible says about a pastor. Oh, he has to be older than 50, or 40, I'm sorry, older than 40, younger than 50. Let me tell you what, that is the prime age for a pastor, by the way, because if you're older than 40, then people think, okay, he's got a little bit of maturity to him. But if you go over 50, then you're just plain flat out too old, right? I mean, never know when he's going to die. I mean, that's, that's, that's the attitude that many places have. Or he might be out of touch with what younger families in that desire. Or he might not have enough energy to, to throw into the church. All those types of things, they all come into play. And age has nothing to do with the effectiveness of a pastor in a church. People also then start um, categorizing their church against other churches. And the demands that they can place on a pastor does tend to have uh, emphasis upon what kind of church they think they are. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, if they are a big, thriving, growing church, they can put many demands on who their next pastor is going to be. Because there's going to be a lot of pastors that are going to want to go to that church. Now, whether or not it's right or wrong is another completely different story, right? Why should a pastor desire to go minister at a church? So he can go make money, right? It's not the desire, and that shouldn't be the desire of what a pastor does, but that is the case in many pastors across the face of this earth. Many pastors, their first calling is to a small church, and they step into that, and that pastor has no desire to stay there for any length of time except to use it as a stepping stone to get to the next place. And he's going to use that place as a stepping stone to get to the next place until he can reach the pinnacle of his prideful thoughts about who he is in this whole realm of being a pastor. So churches look at themselves and they look at the pastor and they decide what kind of pastor they need, what kind of pastor should be there based off of their church size, the ability of their staff, the size of their staff, the style of their preaching, the degrees which they have received academically, books they have written. Let me tell you what, there are some churches you cannot go be the pastor at that church unless you've written a certain amount of books and you have some kind of prestige that you can place out there into the community to draw people to that church. Now, if you remember here in the church in Corinth, they had huge problems. The main problem that they had was with division. They exalted human wisdom and they exalted human leaders. And it's exactly where we find ourselves today in churches across America. They exalt their leaders. And if you're this big church, you need the certain leader that the whole world's going to know who that leader is. 
when uh, Joel Osteen's church needs a new pastor, I'll tell you what, they're not going to hire the guy from down the road that's pastoring the church of 100 people. He's not prestigious enough to be their pastor. They also exalt human wisdom. That's what the world does, and that's what many of our churches do today. I can tell you, because of my age and lack of degrees, I cannot be the pastor for many churches across America. I am not acceptable to them. I'm over 50. I know I look like I'm about 25, but I'm over 50. My hairline uh, lies about my age. And I have no degrees to be a pastor. I have a degree in computer science. I'm not an ordained minister. My minor was missions. I'm not very qualified when it comes to worldly standards to be a minister. But it doesn't mean I'm not qualified to be a minister. I'm not, it doesn't mean I'm not qualified to be used of God in a tremendous way. And if God has called me to be a minister, my degrees should make no difference. But that is where many places are in this world. Let me also say then, this church had a big problem with division. And it's clear in the New Testament that if a man is teaching false doctrines, regardless of his status or what his degrees or whatever they are, then we, as believers, have the right to judge. It's all over Scripture. Because these passages of Scriptures that we're going to get into, they're basically going to say, you can't judge me as a pastor. That's not your right. But we do judge false doctrines. You don't judge your pastor based off of his handsomeness or degrees or whatever it is whether or not he can tell a good story, whether or not he can stir you emotionally. You don't judge those types of things. The only real judgment that you have towards a minister is whether or not he's teaching false doctrines. And we do in the New Testament. We are to judge false teachers and false doctrines. We also judge if a man is living in sin. We've already discussed that, right? In some of our previous, I think in, when we were going through 1 Timothy chapter 6. If your pastor is living in sin, you judge that, you judge it right away, you let the whole world know. And you get him out of your church. Not that he can't go to your church, but he shouldn't be your minister, right? You should try to help him heal and uh, help to win a brother. But at the same time, he doesn't belong to be your minister if he is involved in living in sin so let's go here in first corinthians in chapter four and let's look at the identity of the minister starting in verse number one just knowing who the minister is should be enough to create a proper attitude towards him so let a man so account of us as the minister of Christ and stewards of, a min, uh, of the ministry. Let a man so account. Let us consider him. And we all can consider our pastor, and we should. We should think about our pastor. Whether I'm your pastor or not, whoever the pastor is of that church, you should consider him. Think about him, partially just to make sure he's teaching good biblical truth, partially to make sure he's not living a life of sin. But let this be our consideration. Let a man so account or consider of us as of the ministers of Christ. Now, this is a great word. I wish they would have translated this word exactly as it is written in the Greek. They put the word ministers because it, it carries a an air of some kind of superiority, right? It, it's a position. It, it's a heightened position. And in the early church, that was a very heightened position. And if you go to certain churches, that minister, he stands way up there somewhere in the balconies and talks down to you as he preaches because he's got this elevated position as if he is something greater than you. And I'll tell you, years ago, 
they they all considered themselves greater than you they all put themselves in that elevated authority and they they even write the words of god in, in, into the a language that you could understand they had it all in the latin so only they could understand it and only they could read it and then they would tell you what it meant because they were superior to you this word minister literally means slave Now, we talked about slaves in our morning service, didn't we? It's amazing how these two passages of Scripture have come together at the perfect time. It's not my planning. It's God's planning, okay? I just, I just preach through them, and sometimes it takes me forever to get through a verse. Sometimes I go through it fast. It's just however God is leading. Now, these two passages of Scriptures that we've been studying Sunday morning, Sunday night, are coming together for us. So this word slave carries a lot of meanings, doesn't it? In our morning service, we found out that being a slave is not necessarily a bad thing. Being a slave meant that you were part of the family. Being a slave meant that you were taken care of. It wasn't a bad thing, and it wasn't thought upon as we think about slavery today. As a matter of fact, it was such a good thing, if you will, that here in Scripture it says, consider us as the slaves of Jesus Christ. When I serve Christ, then I am best able to serve you. If I think of myself as being something superior, then I'll never be able to serve you the way that I should. And guess what? If you walk around in this world and you stick yourself up on a pedestal and you say, I'm a Christian, so I'm better than you. I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. Too bad for you. You're going to where you deserve. You're never going to be able to serve those people either, will you? You're not here to be better than them. If you're here to glorify God, guess what? You are here to serve them and to tell them of the love that God has for them. To show them the love that God has for them. And sometimes that means being just like Christ, and that is getting down and washing their feet. Now, I don't think you literally need to wash their feet. They might find that a little freaky and get turned off by that. But we can literally serve them like a servant would, can't we? We can be tremendous neighbors to them. Sometimes we get too focused, by the way, on serving the needs of people or the wants of people than serving Christ. And I must put that in there. See, we are here to minister to people, to be their servants, but we are best positioned when we become a servant of Christ first and do what he asks us to do, not what people ask us to do. The world would ask us to do all kinds of things which would go against what Christ is asking us to do. We do what Christ asks first, and that puts us in the right position to serve them. That means, of course, not bowing to what the world has to say. So the identity of the minister is to be a slave to Christ and his word. In Acts 2 and verse number, or in Acts 26 and verse 16, Jesus was speaking on the Damascus road to the Apostle Paul. He said, I want you to be a slave. This must be the identity of the minister. And it should be your identity too. A servant, a slave to Christ first, then to the world. And then look what also it says. Ministers of Christ, two things that we're supposed to be, and stewards of the ministry, uh, stewards of the mysteries of God. So we're ministers or slaves to Christ, then we're stewards of the mysteries of God. We're servants and we're stewards. Have you ever been on an airplane? What's walking up and down the aisle? A steward right now, I know that they give them different words now. No one, no one wants to be called what they used to be called. You know, you're no longer a janitor. You're a 
You might be a custodian, but even they got rid of that word too. You're 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 a sanitary specialist or engineer or something. Yeah. Um, so it's amazing the words that they come up with nowadays to make you feel good about who you are. There's nothing wrong with being a janitor. It's a great thing to be. It's a wonderful thing to be. They serve all kinds of people in tremendous ways. I am so thankful on every Wednesday and Friday, our janitor comes in and cleans our facilities. I'm so thankful the next day. I wish he was there on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday also because on Monday and Tuesday and, and throughout Wednesday, the bathroom just gets grosser and grosser and grosser until he shows up and cleans up on Wednesday night. It's a wonderful position. But here it talks about a steward. What is a steward on the plane? The steward on the plane kind of dispenses different things to meet the needs of the people sitting there. Used to be way back when they used to make you like little TV dinners and things like that, depending on how long the flight was. Nowadays, if you fly from Grand Rapids to Chicago, you get nothing. Because usually if we fly, we fly from Grand Rapids to Chicago and then we fly somewhere. But that's too short. You're not getting nothing for that. They're going to save their money on those. They don't even serve peanuts anymore because everybody's peanut allergies. They serve these little bags that have like some pretzels in them and some other trail mix. Yeah, trail mix type of thing. But then you get a little bit longer flight and they give you a pop <laughs> and a bag of something. They dispense them. Now, those things that they dispense, do they belong to that steward? No, they don't. They've been entrusted to the, to the steward. They've been given to the steward by Southwest Airlines or United or whoever it is. And they're just in the process of dispensing it, aren't they? Well, the same idea carries through with this. The word steward, by the way, is oikos, which means house, and nomos which means manage. So this is somebody who managed a house. They were the steward of the house. They took care of things that were not theirs. They were technically a slave, but the house owner would have a steward that would manage all of his affairs. And the same idea is coming into play here. You are God's stewards. You prayed to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. The Holy Spirit came in you. And God has dispensed upon you and at your fingertips are everything for life and living. And everything is there for you to shed the word around to everybody else. You are literally the steward of the words of God. He's given us his resources. He has given you special gifts and spiritual gifts. We have his truth. We are to share it. We are to then dispense what? We're to be stewards of what? The mysteries of God. Oh, we love a good mystery, don't we? I do. A whodunit novel. I think Agatha Christie was one of the favorite ones from years ago. Whodunit. Mystery murder, mystery, whatever it is. You read the whole book and at the end you finally realize who it is or so many people you can't stand it and you go to the last chapter and read who did it and you're like, ah, oh, okay, good. And then you read the rest of the book. There is a mystery that was given to the New Testament church, to us. The people in the Old Testament didn't understand it. They didn't understand exactly what Christ was doing and what Christ uh, had to do. They thought Christ was coming to this world, Messiah was coming, he was going to set up his earthly kingdom. They didn't see this time, this age of grace that we're in, this church age. And so that whole mystery was revealed to us in scripture. That's your New Testament. And in particular, the epistles, right? 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. All those things are there. Those are the mysteries that he's talking about. So you know what the Bible is saying here, basically? Simply, God has called me to take his word and dispense it. It's one of the things that we have to do. Whether you're a minister that stands up in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or whether you're a lay person, you are a servant of God 
to dispense his word. So as the minister of this church, I don't want to mess up the word of God. I don't want to get in his way. In Acts 20 and verse 20, it says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and talked to you publicly from house to house. And so I think what's important for a minister then is to understand that as a minister, it is not my goal to formulate an opinion and then dig through the Bible to try to prove my opinion as being correct. By just grabbing one little part of a verse or one verse out of the Bible and say, see, look at this little thing. Look at what it says. And then build this whole thing and tell a whole story and all kinds of things about this little thing that we grabbed out of the Bible that's out of context and it doesn't even mean any of those things. They just use it to prove their points. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to teach the Bible the way God intended it to be taught. Paul told Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. We're going to get to that in our morning services eventually. Rightly divide the word of truth. That word divide means to cut it straight, means direct, and make it easily understood or easily to follow. Just cut a straight line. Tell it the way it is. Don't get yourself fuddled up into it. The quickest way between two points is a straight line. Rightly divide the word of truth. Get to them. That's why the Bible also says to study your study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we should be doing. Dividing it. And as a minister, you will never rightly divide the word of truth if you don't study it. I know some ministers that they go from Mon Monday morning, they get up and they just go wild doing all kinds of crazy things and doing this and doing that. And they never get around to studying. Then they come to morning, they come to church on Sunday morning and they preach just something they made up off the top of their heads and it's no good. You need to be rightly dividing the word of truth. The only way to do that is to study it. So secondly, the requirements of the minister in verse number two. Moreover, that word means in addition. Moreover, in addition to this, it is required in stewards. Now remember the steward. He's the one that was the household manager. That a man be found faithful. If you're going to be a good steward, you need to be faithful. That is the hardest kind of employee to find, isn't it? Faithful employees. I'll tell you what, I need 50 of them to drive buses. We have 50 bus drivers, but I can tell you I don't have 50 faithful bus drivers. I'm not going to tell you who they are, who I think they may or may not be, because they might listen to me on the internet. <laughs> A faithful employee is so hard to find, and businesses out there are dying to find them. You don't have to scheme and do all kinds of ingenious things to be a great minister of the Word of God. You just have to be faithful. Take what I have given to you, pass it on, don't pervert it, don't twist it up, don't corrupt it. That's what God is saying to the minister today. By the way, the, the parable of the talents probably gives us great insight into that. And what did he say to the, the servant that took the talents and multiplied it? He said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He took the talents, took what God had given him, and he used it for God. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for you to be faithful with them. The servant that he denounced was the one that buried it and did nothing with it. I'm afraid many pastors are preparing sermons from the heart or from the head and not the Bible. And the Bible needs to be the source of those sermons and the other things just fill in around to help us understand them. We we'll give illustrations sometimes. The third thing is the attitude. The attitude. But with me, 
it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. <laughs> kind of like that as a minister. <laughs> Go ahead, judge me. That's a pretty small thing. <laughs> Paul is literally saying, I don't care what you think. It doesn't make a difference to me what you think. And more ministers should probably take that to heart. I don't care what you think. What, what have we been learning all through Scripture as we've been studying Timothy and now into, uh, into Corinthians? We've been finding out that we don't care what the world thinks, do we? We've been finding out that these churches had huge problems because people were involving man's thoughts and opinions into the church. And the reality is we shouldn't care about those things. Their opinions don't matter. What matters? What matters is what the word of God says. And if you have something against me, it needs to be something that comes from the word of God, not your opinion. You can have something against me and it can be valid, but it's not your opinion, right? I don't like the way he parts his hair. He should part it on the other side. I have something against him. Well, that's your opinion, right? People shouldn't care about that. Pastor's hair should be longer. Pastor's hair should be shorter. Pastor shouldn't wear a goatee. Pastor shouldn't have an earring, whatever, a nose ring. I don't know what. Those are all opinions, right? It needs to come from the word of God. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. I don't care about your human evaluation. It makes no difference to me. The problem is it's too hard to separate yourself from that in many cases. The reality is when I say I don't care what you think, I really do. I'm a pleaser. I want everybody to like me. I try to get along with everybody. I want to get along with everybody. And so sometimes in my trying to make everybody happy, I might not even be the best leader that God has for me to be because I'm worried about what other people might think and I'm worried about making them happy. And I shouldn't be. It's not about your opinion. It's not about my opinion. It's about God. And even Paul then says, look what he says. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. That's the world's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Because you know what? I shouldn't even be judging myself. Here's an opinion of me. Here's what I think a pastor should be doing. And the word think keeps getting in there. Get your opinions and your thinking out of there. Go to the word of God and see exactly what it says and evaluate yourself off of that. Not even my own evaluation. I need to be evaluated in a different way. Verse number four. For I know nothing by myself. And Paul is saying, I think I'm pretty great. <laughs> It's hard for me to honestly judge myself, isn't it? Because I have my opinion, and my wife will be happy to tell you that I have an opinion on everything. And I think my opinion is correct. I recognize that it's not right all the time. I try not to be overbearing, opinionated, but I do. And so because I have my own opinion on everything, guess what? I know nothing by myself. I think I'm great. I think my opinion is right. If I judge myself, big deal. <laughs> I'm not going to be truthful with myself, am I? My flesh is going to get in the way. I might not be able to find anything against myself. But, yet am I not hereby justified. If I judge myself, and I don't worry about your opinion, and I only worry about my opinion, and I judge myself and don't let anybody else judge myself, I will justify myself. That's what humans do. But look at what it says there. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. You know whose opinion should matter? God's opinion. And I need to judge myself based off of these words right here and nothing else. You can take the words of Spurgeon, 
who many people think of as a great minister, right? Throw them out. See what the words of God say. And you can judge yourself by those. And the Holy Spirit will help you with that. So now the evaluation of the minister. Verse number five. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord come. Don't make evaluations. That's God's business. And guess what? When he comes, he'll be the one that judges. He's the one that will tell you the opinion. You're out of line if you do that. Because what is the Lord going to do? He both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Here's what man does. They see some man, some person, and that, that person is so nice and kind to them. That person is, is wonderful, and, and they treat everybody with kindness, and, and they preach these sermons that stir up the soul and stir up the imagination. They get you to go do things, and guess what? God's going to come someday, and that person's going to stand before God, and you might find out that guy wasn't even a believer. <laughs> he was just a good speaker, and he knew how to schmooze everybody. And inside, he was rotten to the core. God will do that. If you judge and make evaluations yourself, you're, you're, souping, you're serping the seat of the judge, which is Christ. And what will God judge us on? God is going to judge us not on what we did, but he will judge us on our motives. That's why when we uh, went through 1 Corinthians in chapter 3 and we talked about the Bema seat, that's really a judgment on your motives when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You might do really nice things, but your motives could be all out of whack and you'll have nothing left over. As a minister, I need to ask not what I did, but what were my motives? That's exactly what you should be asking yourself too. Don't ask yourself, what did I do in church? What did I do, what did I do, what did I do? Ask yourself, what are my motives as I'm doing them? Am I filled with the Spirit? Am I following the direction of the Holy Spirit? And am I doing it in step with the Word of God? Or are my motives... I'm going to do this thing and it's going to make me feel good. I'm going to do this thing and it's going to promote me and that person I can't stand is finally going to get what's coming to them. What are your motives? Because in the end, after God judges the heart, then every man, then shall every man have praise of God. Only God can give rewards and praise. It'll be based off your motives. It'll be based off of being filled with the Spirit. It'll be based off of the fruits of the Spirit. It'll be based off of what you're doing for God with the right attitude. Am I ministering for myself? Or and a paycheck and whatever else comes with it? Or am I ministering to glorify God? God. I will be honest, I struggle with that question at times. If we're asking that truly of ourself, it's hard for me to get myself out of the equation. I am human. <laughs> I do things wrong. And sometimes I do things out of the wrong motives. I might even preach a sermon out of the wrong motive. I trust that I don't. I don't want to. But there are times when I read over past of scripture, I go, ooh, I'm glad I get to preach on that today because that's a strong point of me. I need, and I need everybody to see things my way with this. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to enjoy preaching this. Is it because I'm going to get some kind of glory out of this and I'm going to get some kind of fulfillment out of it? Or am I preaching the sermon to glorify God? I trust this to glorify God. That's what it needs to be. And if I preach it out of my own selfish motives, 
you're probably not going to get out of it what you should. Then I'm certainly going to be judged for the wrong motives when I get to heaven. So that's a good sermon. Saying you shouldn't judge your pastor. <laughs> but you can look at his life. You can know what kind of man he is. You'll, you'll know if he's teaching false doctrines. And you need to judge those things. I can also tell you that people that leave a church and say, well, I'm not being fed. If that minister is preaching the word of God and he's not teaching false doctrines, then it's your fault that you're not being fed. Because the word of God is there. And if he's not preaching the word of God, that's one thing. But if he's preaching the good word of God with good sound doctrine, the Holy Spirit should help you to understand it and you get fed that way. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this message that you gave to us tonight. Lord, we just uh, are thankful that we have the opportunity to be your servants and your stewards. We get to dispense the word of God. You have gifted us with so many things. You've gifted us with, with talents and abilities. And you've given us everything in the word of God to spread around. And you've given us the Holy Spirit to help us do that. I pray that we'd be good stewards for you. I pray that we would also be your slaves as we go out into this world. People would recognize that we are of you. That we would serve you first and be your slave first. Then that puts us in the right position to be slaves for others around us. And to be able to dispense your word to them. Father, now we just ask that we would go out with these attitudes. We ask these things in your name. Amen.